Well, good afternoon on a Friday in London, and I'm delighted to see so many people uh, turning up for what should be a fascinating talk, fully grown, why a stagnant economy is a sign of success. Uh, with our guest here today, Dietrich Volrath, uh, dialing in from Houston. Now, you'll know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors of Zen Group. Uh, as I always say, it really is a privilege to be able to introduce and chair these various webinars that we hold on FS Group, uh, principally because our sponsors are so tolerant, allowing us to range widely and freely across technology, economics, and finance. Uh, now today, as ever, is quite an interesting session because I think uh, Dietrich is asking a question we're all quite curious about. You know, is there really an end to uh, growth, and what's so bad about that? Maybe it maybe it really is a sign of success. Uh, and what what does that mean? Uh, obviously, coming with a bit of a U.S. angle to it, um, but we like that international angle. Uh, Dietrich and I were chatting about many of the commonalities of some of the things he's touching on with, as many of you will know, the somewhat uh, anarchist David Graeber, uh, the anthropologist, but also people like Richard Verner down in Southampton. So it should be a fun session today. Now, my job, as ever, is to get out of the way and let you hear from the expert. Um, I'd just like to pick up with the obvious questions. Uh, yes, uh, the slides are posted, and in fact, they are already posted. Uh, secondly, if I might say the recording will go up in approximately two days, so uh, perhaps late Monday. Uh, but most importantly, uh, Dietrich will be getting a Q&A session of about 15 minutes towards the end. Would you please use the, the Q&A facility in GoToWebinar? As you type those questions in, they'll be coming in. I will feed them into a conversation with Dietrich. But any questions that go unanswered or any detailed uh, points you'd like to pick up, they will get to him with your email. So please use that facility. If you text me uh, or email me, that's very kind. Unfortunately, I'm here with you, so I won't get those until it's too late. So please do use uh, the Q&A facility. Uh, and with that, if I might say, uh, Dietrich, very much the floor is yours. Looking forward to this. Awesome. All right. Well, Michael, thank you very much, and thanks to everybody for for being here. I know on a Friday afternoon we will we will try and finish the week strong uh, and and get you guys off of a screen, hopefully uh, in, in another hour or so. So, all right. So, Michael has the first slide up, and this is just uh, there's nothing on here that probably is terribly surprising. Um, if you look over the 20th century, growth in GDP per capita in the U.S. was about two and a quarter percent. And from the start of the 21st century forward, it's been about one percent. So we've lost about a point and a quarter off the, the growth rate uh, over the last 20, 20 years. Now, this is, as, as Michael said, uh, the book and one of the kind of the, the driving force behind this was really kind of U.S. centric. But this story of a growth slowdown is pretty similar across most of the advanced world. The, the timing differs a little. Maybe Japan started uh, this slowdown a little earlier. Maybe it started a little later a few other places. But but this is a kind of a common theme across a lot of the industrialized world. So so I think a lot of the themes that I talk about from the U.S. perspective will 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 be relevant to kind of wherever you may be. Right. So this slowdown, um, the question is, well, why? Right. And why did this occur? And and what, how do we interpret that? So the, the first thing I want to do here, and Michael's uh, already popping up the, this poll. So I wanted to give you guys a shot and just ask people to, to, to jump in and, and, and speculate here on what they think is maybe the most important or a important factor in, in this slowdown. Um, taxes and regulation, innovation, concentration. So folks, I've launched the poll. Uh, you know, what drives the slowdown? Taxes and regulation. Innovation focused on clicks, not bricks. Concentration of firms limiting competition. Shift of activity away from goods uh, towards services, or boomers leaving the workforce. Uh, as ever, uh, just use that go-to webinar question facility. Dietrich, approximately uh, half the audience have voted now. I'll give another ten or yeah. fifteen seconds. So I'm a professor, so I like to quiz people. So just if you get it wrong, I'll know. Um, just be aware. You get back right. <laughs> okay, I'll uh, close that poll now, and we'll just redisplay the sorry, display those results to you all. Uh, and you'll see here that the larger largest uh, section of the audience believe a shift of activity away from goods and towards services, uh, and the next largest is taxes and regulation. Wow. 
Right. And then uh, so I think what Michael will do so you can see kind of people are kind of all over the place. And what's interesting is, is Michael clicks to the next slide. You'll see that, unfortunately, you guys are, did not do very well. Um, it's demographics turn out to be. <laughs> sorry. Uh, it really is. So when you do the accounting um, for it, it, most of the slowdown uh, is really demographics. It really is a consequence. So kind of an interesting consequences is that growth was kind of pushed up in the 20th century by the de same demographics that are now pulling it down. And that's driven a lot part by by the baby boom generation and just how how big it was um, entering the workforce and then leaving. And then I think a number of people did jump on to the second big force, just kind of from an accounting perspective, which is this shift towards services. So so one of the first big things I do as part of this project is just say, well, what just proximate causes, just what what can account for for this decline. Um, and it really is the demographic and the shift in the services. So if we hit the next slide, Michael. Uh, I want to say that those two things are driven as by successes. And so the theme of the book is that the things that drive the slowdown are demographics and the shift in the services. And both of those are the result of things going well. Um, both of those are a consequence of improving living standards and a variety of other things I'll, I'll talk about that are that we should see as, as successes. But I want to be clear that that success doesn't mean perfection, right? So the fact that I'm going to make an argument for with you today that, that we should view this slowdown in growth as in fact like evidence of things going well, doesn't mean that, that we should be complacent uh, in that sense. And, and really what I think the maybe the big takeaway would be is that the slowdown in growth tells us in some sense that we have reached the point where the growth rate of the economy maybe can or should be less of a focus uh, for us and we can start focusing on things that aren't related to growth necessarily. Maybe we can be focused more on distributional issues or health issues or environmental issues. And then in some sense, we've, we've achieved the, the ability to care about those things more intensely because we've reached this point of success where growth has slowed down. Uh, if we hit the next slide, please. So let me show you now about when I said this accounting aspect of it, like why do I say that the demographics were that important? And that this just comes out of a, of just kind of a tedious uh, growth accounting calculation that uh, um, that I work through in the book, which looks at the growth rate of GDP per capita across different time periods and breaks that down into three pieces. The contribution from physical capital, so accumulating buildings and bulldozers and computers, the contribution from human capital, uh, number of workers relative to the population, their education, their experience, how many hours they work, all that kind of stuff. And then productivity, kind of the, the leftover that's explained by everything else, which is in general stuff like technology and allocations across industries and stuff. So the first line there shows you that in the 20th century and by 20th, post-war, 50 to 2000, the growth rate of GDP per capita was about two and a quarter percent. And that you can break down into those three pieces. And and I'm molding there the human capital piece just to note that it during the 20th century, that was almost one percentage point of the growth rate was coming from increased human capital per person. Right. And a big chunk of it's coming from productivity and natural physical act capital accumulation doesn't actually account for a whole lot. We That was just kind of keeping pace as opposed to accelerating. Now the second two, or the last two lines, sorry, are, are two different ways of looking at what happened in the 21st century. And the, the middle one from 2000 to 2008, I have that in there because I want to be clear that this is not a financial crisis driven slowdown necessarily. This is something that started to occur before 2008, 2009 and the financial crisis, it was already happening. So from uh, uh, 2000 to 2008, you see the, the drop already in the growth rate of GDP per capita. And notice in that, that, that middle column with human capital that the, the growth rate, uh, of human contribution of, of human capital was a huge drop, right? So it went from almost 1% to almost 0%. Productivity growth slowed some, but most of this is driven by the drop in human capital growth. If you look across kind of the, the full range of data that I was working with in the book from 2000 to 2016, uh, where we get to the full slowdown, where GDP per capita is only growing at 1%, uh, then you can see that human capital in that period was really, in fact, shrinking. So human capital available per capita per person was, in fact, shrinking at about 
uh, I guess 15 basis points or, you know, uh, uh, 15 hundredths of a, of a percentage point. And so you can see the difference from the 20th to the 21st century, right? That drop. So the, when I make the claim that the demographics were really driving the slowdown, it's, it's this number, this 0.96 dropping all the way to minus 0.15. We went from adding to growth in a big way to subtracting from growth. Aside that, aside from that, you see a small drop in productivity growth and a small change in physical capital. In fact, physical capital started to grow less negatively, so it actually was helping. It's the other, the other aspect of this is the productivity growth. So the, so the story of the slowdown from pure numbers perspective is human capital and then a little bit of productivity drop. If we could hit the next slide. So let's talk about the, that demographic aspect. It's, it's accounting for most of the drop in growth. And so where does that come from? And it's, it's kind of easiest to see, uh, played with a million different versions of graphs to try and show this. And I think this one is pretty good. Uh, what you're looking at in the dark line is the growth rate, an average growth, uh, kind of averaged over a long uh, period of time, uh, the growth rate of the, the population of 15 to 64 year olds in the economy, which is a common range of ages. It's not perfect um, in some sense because it's not quite working age, but it's about right. So that shows you the growth rate of that subset of the population. And the dashed line is showing you the growth rate of the overall population. So back in the 50s there, you look back on the far left of the graph, you see in the mid 50s, here, this is kind of picking up 45 to 50, you see the origins of the baby boom. The population itself, the dashed line, is, is growing very quickly, but the, the number of 15 to 64 year olds, the dark line, is, is pretty low. It's below 1%. That's because we're having a bunch of babies, and babies aren't 15 yet. Now, as we hit the 60s and into the 70s and into the 90s, what happens to that baby boom generation? Well, they turn 15, they turn 20, they hit the labor force, right? So now the, the fraction of the, or the growth rate of the part of the population that works is booming. And the overall population growth rate, that dashed line, isn't very big, right? Why? Because the boomers are entering the workforce, but they aren't having kids nearly as fast as their parents did. And we'll talk about that in a second. Now, the consequence, this has a big consequence, right? Because it, it's this, this kind of, you know, the, the python eating the rat kind of thing. We get this baby boom moving through the economy. It's this big bulge of people in working age. They don't have a lot of kids following them up. You see the little echo boom turning 15 there around 2000. Uh, but really what happens is that the baby boomers now are leaving, right? And so the workers relative to the actual population is collapsing. And that turns out to be a dominant factor in growth. It just is a big deal um, because of the absolute size of that generation. So let's go ahead and hit the next slide, please. All right. So what I want to do in order to make a little more of the case that, that the demographics and really that, that, that raw age structure, the baby boomers moving through the economy are, is important, is to break down that human capital number I showed you a couple slides ago and break that down even further. So you can do this again, you, you make some assumptions uh, about how education and experience play into the amount of human capital and such, but you can do the same similar kind of accounting. So from, from 50 to 2000, that growth rate of human capital from the prior slide was 0.96%. Right? And of that, that was coming from some part from education, 0.7 uh, uh, percentage, Points were coming from increased education. The baby boomers are going to high school at higher rates, going to college at higher rates okay, than, than previous generations. Experience adds a little, um, and then you see the workers per population growth, right? That's that big bulge on the, on the graph I showed you on the figure of boomers getting into working age and not having a lot of kids. So workers to population is, is growing at 0.45 percentage points per year. That's a big part of the growth rate of human capital overall. And then hours per week are shrinking. Hours per week have been shrinking for, for decades, if not centuries. So that's kind of always this kind of drag on the amount of, of human capital being put to use. If you jump forward to the 21st century, then uh, the growth rate of human capital per capita drops down to negative 0.15 percent. So that's that big drop. So where does it come from? Well, it comes some, a little bit from education, right? So education is slowing down in part because kind of once everybody goes to high school, it's hard to make more people go to high school. So that kind of a, that achievement is, is, uh, 
um, is is not keeping up. Um, but the really important factor here is when you look at the bolded numbers is that the growth rate of workers to population goes from positive 0.45% down to negative 0.35. So massive drop and it accounts for most of the drop in slower uh, human capital growth, right? And that number is really that baby boom generation contributing to growth in the 20th century and then starting to dissipate as we hit the 21st. Right? And because of their size, it just is a dominant feature. Okay. So if we can hit the next slide. There it is. So the question now is why? Well, why did this kind of happen this way? Why did the baby boom generation not get followed up by another big generation, right? And so what we see, you kind of go look backwards at what's happening to the baby boomers, right? Well, they're born, right? They hit the labor market uh, starting in the 60s and into the 70s. And what's going on as they are reaching the stage of making family and, and life decisions? Well, there's higher living standards, right? So post-war GDP per capita is growing very quickly. And we've reached a stage in many senses in the US and for a lot of countries that would come a couple decades later, but we're reaching this post-war where their material uh, living standards are, I'm not saying peaking, but they're, they're reaching kind of where widespread um, availability of basic goods and services, right? Electrification occurs, plumbing now gets spread out essentially across 100% of the country, food is readily available. Like we've kind of are see, you know, reached the level where living standards are not materially limited anymore. Well, what does that do? That starts to make people less in some sense or more conscious of their their own time uh, and make it more desirable to focus on building careers, building professions, building their own security before they start a family and we start to see later uh, ages of marriage. And this 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 connection of higher living standards to to later marriage and smaller ultimately family sizes is something we see cross-sectionally. Uh, within countries, as people get richer, they tend to have smaller families. Uh, and we see it over time in essentially every country we've ever looked at, which is that as countries get richer, they tend to have smaller families. Right? And this operates mainly through marriage ages as opposed to, to, to birth spacing. It's essentially people wait longer to get married because they're building, they're spending more time working, uh, building careers and uh, before they end up in the, the family building part of their life. The second big aspect of this that contributes to the big decline in fertility rates that the, the baby boomers have of why they don't have a follow up boom uh, is the pill uh, that becomes available in the early 60s. It, it spreads uh, across the country very quickly, uh, becoming legalized. And what do we do? We have really good research on this now, which is fascinating, which is you can kind of track the differences across the country as the pill gets introduced. And what do you see? You see women staying in school, high school longer, going to college at higher rates. And interestingly, men do as well because the control over their uh, family planning that it's given to women by the pill allows them to finish school, go to college. Well, it keeps the guys that they may have ended up having a kid a little early with from having a family as well. And those guys are able to finish school and go to college. So the pill has these big spillovers of boosting everybody uh, everybody's education um, achievement and boosting people into the ability to build those careers where they may then want to delay marriage and they wait and they say with the pill, I can wait and we can both have a career. We can build one of our careers. But essentially, this ends up with people delaying marriage and getting to the point where once they're married, they're only having two kids, one or two kids, as opposed to their parents who are having three and four. Right? So the baby boomers, you know, my personal example in this, I'm kind of lined right up with this. My my mom is a just right on the cusp of the start of the baby boom. My mom's one of four. Um, of those four kids, uh, two of those kids each had two of their own children and two of my uncles and aunts don't have any kids. Right. So the you can almost in my family alone, you can see uh, the drop in fertility rates. OK. Um, and that's coming from, like I said, these higher living standards, the pill. And the last one is women's labor force participation, right? So at the same time that women are able to enter the workforce and control their own uh, kind of family destinies, 
what else are they doing? They're entering and being allowed finally for the first time to enter a number of professions that they were kind of blocked out of. And so this also builds this kind of career building, later marriage age aspect in it. Ultimately, it means the baby boom's not followed up by another large generation. There's me. I'm a Gen Xer right in the middle of it, and there's five of us. I swear to God, that's all that there are in the U.S. There's, there's baby boomers, there's a bunch of millennials, and there's me. Okay? This has demographic consequences. That's what's on those prior slides. It, it really is just baby boomers entering and then exiting. And if you look at all the things on this slide, these are successes. These are good things. This is higher living standards. This is women with control over their own um, families and their own number of children. This is women being able to enter new professions uh, equally. None of this is something we should be worried about. It had an unintended consequence, um, but it's a consequence, I think, easily, arguably, something we'll, we'll accept, right? So the slow growth we get now is a consequence of these good things that happened decades ago and the choices that were made in response to these good things. Okay. Let's hit the next slide. Yes, the shift in the services. So the demographics are kind of the big story. Accounting wise, they take care of most of the slowdown. But the second big thing that's part of the slowdown is part of that productivity, the decline in productivity growth. Right? And this one really is you know, in terms of being applicable across many, many economies, this story is, is one that very much is, right? And that's the shift in the services. This this figure just kind of displays it. It's, it's something you may, this crowd probably already has kind of an intuition about, which is that from 1970 and even before that forward, uh, the share of GDP, share of value added of GDP, that is accounted for by manufacturing has been shrinking. And the share of GDP accounted for by things like health and social services, professional services, legal uh, accounting, things like that, uh, that's been going up. And info and communications, so essentially computer programming, stuff like that. All this stuff has been increasing. Well, the production of uh, manufacturing share has been declining. As a share of what we produce, goods, things are declining, and uh, services or experiences, those things are increasing. Now, just as a side note, that decline in the share of manufacturing doesn't mean that we have are producing less stuff. The quantity is going up. The price is just falling so fast that it's it's a shrinking fraction of economic activity. Right. So this is this is what we see happening across many, many countries. OK, so let's hit the next slide, which is a poll again. So let's talk about why did that happen. Right. So if there you go. Just launching the poll. Second poll. Why did manufacturing decline. Chinese competition, offshoring, higher productivity didn't translate to higher demand, or private equity stripping firms for cash. As ever, FS Club members are swift on the buttons here, Dietrich. They were almost at the halfway mark. Past the halfway mark. Creeping on up. Almost the majority of the audience has voted now. Awesome. Another second or two. Great. And I'm now ready to close the poll and present the results to you. See so higher do. productivity didn't translate to higher demand is the big the big winner here. All right, you guys were clearly studying in between the first poll and this one. I appreciate <laughs> reading the book in the last five minutes. Um, right. So most of this is going to come from this higher productivity is great and it lowers prices. But it doesn't actually lead to higher demand in sense of expenditures, right? We take advantage of the low prices to spend less on the manufactured goods, but we're not buying more. The the example I give every time I talk about this is uh, we got really good at making refrigerators and they got high quality at relatively low price and nobody wants eight refrigerators in their house. Okay, so we end up spending a smaller share of our income on refrigerators. Not because they're not good, but because we can. Oh, okay, I have a refrigerator. I don't need seven. And the savings I spend on what? Well, I take I take vacations and I uh, you know I hire a lawyer and I go to the doctor and I do all maybe go take a class. Like I I start buying services with the money I save getting cheap goods. Okay. And so this this move into services is an unintended consequence again of the fact that good productivity growth in the goods producing sectors of the economy, manufacturing, 
productivity growth in those sectors is really high over time. It's 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 very big. Services productivity growth, on the other hand, is pretty low, right? And this combo has both an uh, both drives this and then has an unintended consequence. So it drives it because it makes goods cheaper relative to services, right? And so that explains the decline in manufacturing as a share. We we shift our spending away from goods and towards services. Um, or expenditures away because services are relatively expensive. So they make up a larger fraction of what we spend. But the unintended consequence of this is that overall productivity growth is a weighted combination of productivity growth in goods and productivity growth in services. As productivity growth, as goods become a smaller and smaller fraction of economic activity, overall productivity growth gets pulled down. We get pulled towards the service productivity growth rate. Right, because we spend so much of our money on services and less and less of our money on goods. Okay, so we hit the next slide. Let's talk about why that is. So, this is, I think, kind of as a side note, this is a really fascinating conversation about what what is why are goods and services so different? And this, I will I will point you if you find this interesting. The, the William Baumol is kind of the godfather of, of thinking about this and and writes a really access a couple of very accessible uh, uh, versions of of stories about why why this is, but but really I think you can boil it down to this, which is that that in in goods labor makes the product uh, versus services where labor is the product, right? And and so if you think about the refrigerator, right? So it takes labor to bake the refrigerator, but once that it's built, I don't I don't need that refrigerator assembly person there no one has to show up to my house to open the refrigerator for me or press the buttons on it i you just i open the door i put the stuff in it gets cold right so so the labor from my perspective as a consumer is irrelevant right and so as a manufacturer if you can lower the amount of labor you use i don't care right it's not very terribly relevant to me so it makes it makes it plausible for you to really attack productivity and goods because your customers like that and don't care if you use less labor think about a service so i i i'm a professor i teach uh if you're a lawyer if you're an accountant or if you're a doctor what do you do you essentially you are the product right like your labor is what people are purchasing your time and very intensely uh is what people want right like i can't go to my dean and say that i've gotten twice as good at lecturing so i'm going to run my classes half as long um that's not going to fly uh different professions like like a lawyer. lawyers charge by their time right that's what you're buying from them is their attention for a certain amount of time so that makes it very hard to increase productivity why because if you try and pull labor away from that that activity people notice and they get mad right if you know what's a common complaint at least in the US about healthcare is that my doctor won't spend enough time with me so if we want more productive health care, we want our doctors to spend less time with each patient. We want things to go quicker. But nobody likes that. Right. So the, the productivity differences between the two sectors are kind of fascinating that way. And as it turns out, we aren't willing to substitute goods for services. We you make and make refrigerators as cheap as you want, but I'm still not going to buy refrigerators instead of going to the doctor. Right. There's there's no substitution there. So, again, this is an unintended consequence of us getting really, really good at making things. Is that we've actually driven our own productivity growth rate down. Right? And again, that's a success. Right. That's a good thing. We've gotten so good at making our stuff for ourselves that we don't need to spend as much money on the high productivity growth items like refrigerators. And we spend a lot more of our money on low productivity growth stuff like economics lectures. Right. And that's unfortunate for the growth rate, but it's great because it means we have a lot of cheap goods. Right. Like a lot of accessible, high quality, cheap goods. Let's hit the next slide. All right. So let's maybe think about alternatives here. Right. Um, I'm telling you it's demographics and the shift into services. Uh, it's those both things are both successes um, on, on almost any dimension. But of course, and you guys answered in the poll to, to begin with, right, had a number of other concepts about what was driving uh, the slowdown. And, and 
and and while I kind of made fun of everybody, none of those are really technically wrong. Um, they all had impacts on the growth rate. And as it turns out, quantitatively, those impacts were just very small relative to the demographics and the shift into services. So it's not that they didn't happen. It's not that they didn't even move in the direction you're thinking. It's just that as it turns out, when you do the numbers, it just is too small to explain the overall slowdown, right? So a number of alternatives, I talk about a bunch of these in the book is a lack of innovation. It's not clear that you can actually talk about a lack of innovation. You certainly can't look at lower productivity growth and, and equate that to less innovation, partly because of things like the shift into services. That's not a change in innovation. That's just a consequence of demand and preferences being the way they are. So productivity growth isn't a good indicator that innovation has, in fact, declined. We can talk about market power and talk about a bunch of it, uh, about that a bunch in the book. What's interesting about market power, it certainly has gone up. It certainly has in our minds. We think of the intuition being like, well, this is terrible, right? We have, have more, more firms kind of charging markups and, and being acting more like monopolists. As it turns out, a lot of that increase in market power is, again, partly the shift into services and into in us changing our demand and going and chasing down high markup firms. It's not necessarily true that that has a big negative for, for productivity growth. Mobility, taxes, inequality, trade, those things all do have consequences for growth. They're just really small. Okay. So on we hit the next slide. And I'll just give you this is this is really the summary of, of, of the argument, which is that we started the top line with growth uh, from 50 to 2000, about two and a quarter percent. And in the book, I, I talk through how I get to some of these numbers, but essentially you lop off about eight tenths of a percentage point because of the demographics. It's probably bigger, but I'm trying to be conservative. Uh, you lop off about two tenths of a percentage point from that shift from goods to services. And that's most of the, the drop, right? That's most of the slowdown. And those two things, like I said, are, are, are best viewed as successes. The other things that could be failures, the slower firm and worker reallocation, maybe due to market power, maybe due to mobility issues, uh, that could maybe knock off uh, 15 hundredths of a percentage point, mobility maybe 10. Uh, that could add up to the rest. You might be able to argue with me that about a, a quarter percentage point is, is due to failures, but, but honestly, roughly zero comes from taxes, trade, and inequality. Right? Those things are more about distributions than they are about the growth rate. And that's what gets us down to the 1%. So success really is what drove the drop in the growth rate. Okay. So let's hit that next uh, slide, Michael, please. And that should be the last poll. Right. It, it is indeed, Dietrich. What would you do to reverse the slowdown? Now, folks, this is a trick question. I'll <laughs> just let you know. The, the answer is obviously the first one. Bulldoze homes to create demand for construction. We did. We wanted to give you an easy one to finish, right? That was the best thing. I think you must be a good teacher. You're batting 100% so far. Oops, not quite. Okay. <laughs> we have some misogynists amongst us, <laughs> have some construction workers. Uh, yeah, but uh, I will now close the poll because I think folks have probably got the idea yeah. and are toying with you. <laughs> there we go. Right. So, like, uh, so we're, uh, by the way, we're taking names, by the way, for those of you who answered the, uh, the atheist. Uh, <laughs> right. So, I've. So obviously this poll is a little bit of a, you know, it's it's a leading poll here. Um, it really is to point out, like, once you think about, right, and it's just a different way of kind of thinking about why this is success is like once once you think about what would you actually be willing to do to get the growth rate to go back up, I think the answer is nothing <laughs> because uh, because the things you'd have to do to really reverse the 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 drop in growth we've seen are things that are you'd have to get rid of good stuff that you like and if that's the case then that means the growth slowdown was really driven by success right that those things are things we don't want to give up then that must mean we like them and so let me just finish you know i, I mentioned there real quickly again success is not perfection and, and and so maybe the big takeaway michael and i talked about this earlier this week is kind of what's the big message and i think the, the big message out of the book is to say Look, the, the growth rate has fallen for good reasons. It means that what we can now do is focus on issues and questions and areas of concern without having to freak out about the growth rate. It's fine. 
don't worry about it. Let's talk about things like the environment or equity or what have you. Um, and have that discussion without worrying about whether the growth rate is going to get pushed way up or pushed way down by. That's fantastic, Dietrich. We've got quite a few comments and questions out here, so get your breath for a second. Uh, as yep. you're well aware, Robert Solo in uh, 1987 said that computers turn up everywhere except in the productivity <laughs> statistics. Yep. Um, Charles Vermont is curious, what has been the effect on PC uh, sorry, on um, uh, uh, per capita GDP of computerization. And I might tack on to that. Is that an area that might be able to be reversed? That could be a future success, i.e. much more automation. Yeah. Uh, so I think, right, so if you if you break down the, the, the growth rates even more finely over time, you'll see that there was this spike in the 90s. It kind of started to rise again, and then it, it came back down. And that's that's partly us getting really good at producing computers. But I think in some sense what you get out of the, the computer area, certainly the hardware side, is the, the standard goods to services thing. We're ridiculously good now globally at making computers. I mean, they're, well, I mean, they're ridiculously cheap. And while I have lots of computing power in my house, mostly I take advantage of that to spend less on computing, right? And I think that I think computerization actually kind of accelerates that shift into services um, as opposed to reversing it. Okay. Uh, we had uh, Charles Goodhart and Manoj Prodan uh, earlier uh, last year uh, talking about their book, The Great Demographic Reversal. Hugh, Hugh Purser is curious, drawing on the lessons um, from that book, it would seem from today's presentation that the demographic effect will actually accelerate the reduction in growth even further. Uh, are you in line with her thinking on that? Yeah, I think that's the case for, I mean, I think we're looking out at uh, several decades of that. Now, ultimately, it will moderate, I mean, barring some other gigantic kind of demographic event along the lines of another baby boom or collapse. But so eventually this will kind of work its way out. Eventually that that rat in the python kind of thing from the baby boomers will, will leave. But that is decades away. So 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 it I think for the foreseeable future, yeah, that drag is existing. And if you look across countries, you'll see that, right? It's 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 still got decades to run um, in pretty much all of the Western countries. Um, Bob McDowell asks an intriguing question. I don't have any idea here. Uh, what uh, have there been any other sort of baby boomer type cycles in countries uh, not caused by World War Two? So uh, China, some of the Asian countries, some places in Africa. Are they having the same type of boomer uh, effects in them? It's just that the causes are not what yeah. we think of. Yeah, exactly right. So, and I think that's uh, there's a there's a, a pretty thick literature on kind of what people call the demographic dividend in places like South Korea and China, where it really is the dividend really comes not really from having a boom, right? It's it's the collapse in fertility yeah. following that really causes the boom because now you've got workers without a bunch of kids basically and so korea um china even vietnam and a lot of the east asian countries seem to have had that and now as you look so china i think we we, we know is now hitting the point where it's flipping over korea is soon japan already has and in places like vietnam are close actually uh in the same way so yes this this kind of dynamic is is pretty clear you can see it in a lot of places actually yeah Interesting. I mean, uh, Peter Lewis was interested in, in your comments there on how that was going to play out in China. But I'd like to turn uh, to back to IT and automation and AI, but kind of looking ahead rather than back sure. to the PC boom of 87 or something. Um, Liz Thrussell is curious about what about automation and services, AI, what might be the effect? Uh, Matthew Leach has a really interesting point. He says, I do a lot of teaching. The limit on my productivity as a service provider seems to be student brains. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that actually a more general thing that services often require the receiver to do something yeah. and they often don't get more expert even if the service provider does. It's kind right. of analogous to your doctor example. Wow. Fantastic point on the fact that the, the service often require exactly requires an interaction and that the, the customer will re remain, and I think that it's the student thing, remains unexpert at doing. Now, on the other hand, I think it's, you know, I can't dismiss some of the idea. There's certainly no way to dismiss the concept that maybe there is some kind of surge in, in productivity in the service sector coming. And I think maybe 
there's there's the two quick ways I've uh, you could think about it are one is just that we've never really thought hard about how to do it in services. We've spent most of our time for the last thousands of years trying to come up with better ways of producing material goods because those were the immediate needs. Maybe we just haven't turned our attention fully this way yet. So I think that might be a way we get there. Another, there's an interesting one as well is that that some of maybe what's why service productivity is low is is essentially because uh, it's mismeasured um, because we're as we're transitioning to a service economy, we're essentially drawing in people who weren't kind of trained to be in a service economy. And this is kind of a transitional problem, but that maybe in the future, uh, as kind of everybody expects to be a service worker, they'll be trained or be better at it. Uh, so I think there there are reasons we could imagine there could be be more rapid productivity growth in services. I'm going to wrap a few together. It's kind of interesting. Uh, as you know, Godwin's law says that uh, no, no online conversation uh, yeah. is complete until it ends with people insulting each other as fascists or Nazis. I think no economics conversation is complete until we talk about inequality and distribution. Um, so I'm going to read a few points here. Um, uh, firstly, Ian Harris, uh, both the economic shocks of the past 12 to 15 years, the credit scrunch and COVID, have led to increasing wealth inequality. How do we tackle wealth distribution without asking rich turkeys to vote for Christmas if we are fully grown now? Uh, Douglas Andrews is curious about, uh, he says, your argument seems to ignore the impact of U.S. tax policies, not overall, but favoring the least productive and inquisitive segments of American society. Um, so there's that. And I must say, you know, the Economist, for example, over the last, uh, I suggest, about two years, seems to have a thing on that competition does seem to be increasing. It was one of your arguments yeah. in the slide earlier, but maybe times have changed. So are, are we almost seeing kind of as this has grown and we now got a distributed pie, we're, we're freezing up rather than changing? Yeah, I, I think that. Right. So I think so I think that's a good point, which is that it's it's one of the maybe dangers of slow growth going forward. So it, it may be a success that got us here. But if the pie essentially is going to stay the same size, then the fight becomes about how much of the pie do we get? Whereas maybe in the past, with the pie growing really rapidly, it was you could avoid those arguments. right? Like, well, my, everybody's piece is getting bigger. And so the exact proportions aren't important. Everybody's getting more pie. Whereas now it becomes a much more win lose, you know, kind of situation for people. And I think that's that may be the case. Right. Um, you know, it's hard to argue that that's against that. That seems to be kind of how things are going. Um, I, I think maybe the point I would make is is. Is that some of what we need to do is is get used to or, or come come to accept the fact that the pie isn't going to be enlarging a lot or very rapidly. And that we can't get away with, I think what we've done in the past is get away from talking about distribution questions by saying, yeah, yeah, but the pie is just growing fast. Don't worry about it. Hmm. And now we just need to have those discussions more head on. I um, don't have a solution for that, but. <laughs> just a quick thing. Uh, if, if Vaughn Edwards is curious, so you haven't touched on immigration. Uh, would that Would that make a material difference? It, it would. So uh, one thing I didn't throw up there just in, in terms of timing is, if you know, kind of what would you do? And I could have thrown that in the poll. Uh, one of the direct ways you could address the slowdown in a place like the U.S., I think the U.K. would be similar. And a lot of the Western countries would be similar is immigration. Right. If the, the, the demographics are pulling workers out of the population, then import workers. Right. And fill back in. And I do a little back of the envelope stuff in the book about what it how much immigration would it take to offset the, the, the decline? And it for the U.S., we typically in a I say typically in a 2016, 2017 world, we were taking in about 750,000 to a million immigrants a year. If you took us to 1.5 to 1.75 million, we'd offset most of the slowdown. Right. Oh. So it's it's doable. Right. It's, and, and that number is in a percentage range that the U.S. is that was the 20s. Right. In terms of percent. So uh, it's doable. And I think immigration is the one immediate way you could really address a slowdown. Uh, we're going to squeeze in two more somehow. So we'll have to be quick. But, uh, 
Uh, there's two comments here. One from Peter Cousins. Slower growth means that young people no longer have the expectation that they will have increasing living standards, which seems to be leading to some disaffection. How do we convince them that despite that, they've never had it so good? And Douglas uh, Andrews has a quip I can't resist. He's reminded of Barrington Moore's comment that the problem with quantitative approaches to history is that they show that things really weren't so bad just before the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I like that one. I'm yes, I'm a little guilty of that. Uh, yeah, and then this is where I think, you know, I didn't hit long on it, but I think why in the in the book I try to be a little more clear about the success is not perfection kind of thing, which is I don't want to get caught in the Barrington Moore thing where they're like, no, if you look back, it was fine, right? Things were fine. It's not that things are fine. It's that the we look at it, slow growth and we say, ah, oh, this is not good. Well, we got there out of good reasons. It doesn't mean that it's good. It, it just means that that there's, like I said in the last poll, there isn't necessarily things we'd want to reverse, the things we'd want to do to change the growth rate. I think in terms of kind of going forward, I actually think that some of what we see from, especially like kids I think about, I teach in these, these, these coming generations, I think they appreciate that there is are dimensions of quality of life beyond the growth rate and beyond GDP and beyond the wage that they care about. And in that sense, it's not telling them, yeah, yeah, you kids don't get higher living standards. It's, well, our living standards in terms of material goods aren't maybe going to go up crazily, but now is our chance to improve on those other dimensions. And I think they're okay with that in some sense. I think you look at some of the the, the younger generations now, they in fact are advocating for that. So they may in some sense have a feel already that, yeah, that why do I want more material goods? Well, I'm fine. My, par my parents' basement is lovely. <laughs> uh, but let's clean up the environment, right? That, uh, so I think that that's not actually as hard to sell as it seems. Uh, a quick closing one, uh, and it sounds silly to make it quick, but the board's lit up uh, really rapidly with uh, Trevor Hilder kicking off. How are you sure that measures of GDP are accurately measuring more intangibles? And I was getting a whole bunch of GDP related questions. Um, and I sent out to the audience, said, don't worry, we'll, we will touch on this. Uh, but I know it's a big thing. And you and I chatted about it in our warm up as well. Just some closing thoughts. We've got this one measure GDP and all sorts of proposals for additions to it, extensions to cover the environment or health or education or whatever. Just in a nutshell, what are your thoughts on where we should be heading with that argument? I So I am a, I guess the way I would say it is I'm a GDP minimalist in the sense that I don't think we should be ta trying to tack things. We shouldn't be trying to tack everything onto GDP and find a way to wedge it into t GDP. GDP is great at what it does, what it says on the tin. Right. And just let it be what it is, a measure of economic, raw economic activity. What we should be striving for is to have clear measures, maybe some nice single numbers or measures of things that are we think are equally important. Health, uh, uh, access to uh, maybe amount of people with access to a certain minimum basket of goods, which is not GDP, but is a useful number uh life expectancy all those things we we should see those all as maybe equally as important but i don't think it makes sense to try and wedge them into gdp well, you come up with a price for that impute this then it becomes very opaque yeah okay well it was interesting because kurt's file himself who created it warned us about it i think it started early with president kennedy didn't criticizing GDP uh, as well. Bobby, as it turns out, yeah, Bobby, Bobby had the great speech about, uh, yeah, it doesn't measure the things you maybe want to measure. There you go. Well, look, uh, we could go on clearly, and it's been really enjoyable and a nice way to end a Friday here in London, although I hope we haven't destroyed your working day in Houston. Um, I've got three quick rounds of thanks to give here. Firstly, as ever, to our sponsors. I hope that they've enjoyed it and felt it showed them in a good light, yet again, exploring another corner of technology, economics, and finance. Um, I would like, if I could as well, to thank the audience. Uh, super today. Good, good fun. Uh, thanks very much for the questions. As ever, they will all get their way to Dietrich if he wants to answer directly with your email. Um, a reminder that, uh, surprise, surprise, in this time of a lockdown, we have a full week next week. Uh, it's a bit crypto. It's a bit AI. Uh, it'll be kind of fun and interesting. As ever, check out the website. And finally, uh, Dietrich, you, I, we hadn't met until recently, but I've enjoyed it immensely. 
And I'm afraid in these days of uh, COVID and credit scrunches and all that, I'm unable to open the floodgates uh, of laws that I'm sure are lurking out there. But I have brought with me my Korean karmic clapper. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate it. In, in true productivity efficiency, that will have to do uh, for the many, many applauses that everybody wanted to give to you. So thank you very much for coming today. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for, for listening in and all the questions. And, and please feel free. I, I love hearing about this stuff, so I will try and get back to as much as I can.